I probably won't say anything to you that you don't really already know. You just might not know it until I say it to you, but as soon as I do, you may find out that I reduce it to a very simple type of equation. One plus one equals two. It's a simple equation. But I'm going to make it even more simple. One plus any other number still equals one. Now I'm going to go ahead, now that I've confused you and confounded you with that great intellectual spill, I'll go ahead and show you why that's so. I can only show it to you verbally, but at the same time, if you decide that you know more than I do, you won't get what I'm going to talk about. And if you decide you know less than I do, you won't get what I'm going to talk about. But if you can decide you know equally what I know, then I'll be able to explain more to you than what I might normally be able to. The reason why is I can't speak above the consciousness of the group. I have to speak to an average of it. So I will go from some place to real mundane mediocrity, if there's anybody here like that, to high superlative divinity, if there's anybody here like that. And if not, we'll just deal with fudge most of the time, and we'll see how that turns out. The work that I do is very simple. The simplicity of it is that it's every man's inherent right to know and do this. And more than the right to know and do this, to have the conscious awareness that you're doing it. And that is soul transcendence. Or popularly called soul travel, and erroneously called astral travel. And I'll delineate those for you. Looking at the spiritual hierarchy in terms of starting with the physical body here, and we want to run it in a vocabulary into the invisible planes so you'll know what I'm speaking of. Uh, it goes like this way, the physical here, then the astral level, which in there we find a great deal of emotionality because of the way the imagination produces it. Above the astral level is the causal level or the seed level, which would be the emotional level if we're looking at it in terms of just emotions but not how you feel about things. And in that level resides the primary destiny of us in the physical world, what we're going to do, what we can do, what we uh, are going to be allowed to do. Now that sounds restrictive, and it, it is in these lower levels. The level above that would be the mental level, and that will be where every one of us uh, do the intellectual numbers and uh, take apart what I'm saying and put it back together better. Well, down there I can do that also, but when I get up here it's a little more difficult. In fact, often when I review some of the videotapes, uh, I think I could have said that this way and it had been much clearer and uh, a much clearer representation. So next time that I'm up, I do it that way. Except when I get up here, I never am able to do it that way. I'm always doing it the way the Spirit brings it to give it to me. And I think often it's testing your durability to see if you can put up with it. <laughs> Some a person said to me, well, aren't you ever afraid of making a mistake? And I said, well... If I were doing it, yes, but I'm not. However, some people can't see more than the physical body, so they figure that's me doing it. And uh, they will attribute the mistake to me, and I'm rather flattered to think that they've even got me that close to the Spirit. And those who can see the higher frequencies say, well, no, you would uh, be an error to attribute that to his uh, physical body, the same way you'd think that he's talking out of his hand if he does this while he's talking. Because they can see that the other thing is there present. So the intellectual becomes one where most of us on this planet strive to go. And for the most part, almost all the religious philosophies, theories, philosophical approaches, and sociological, psychological, psychiatric, and all those therapies are involved in the intellectual point of view of our mind, and for the most part, that comes into the educational field, and our minds have been set up to be computers, garbage in, garbage out. And once in a while, we're able to screen it and pull the garbage and put it aside and get the essence of it. And then we're, we are a wonderment to ourselves how we did that. 
because normally it doesn't come out that way. We will astound ourselves with our own profound wisdoms and knowledge and wonder why we can't keep doing that over and over and over. Uh, either it would be these types of moments when the next level appears, the etheric level, or often called the unconscious or the subconscious. All those levels, physical, astral, causal, mental, etheric, are the psycho-material worlds or the psychic worlds. And even this world that's material here actually has psychic frequencies mixed in with it. And a lot of people uh, will tell you about that. They'll try to find holy places to live or sacred spots. Is uh, this city got a good sacred vibration as well as this city? And uh, some of them asked me this, and I said, well, look, why don't you just make it sacred wherever you are and you can forget all that other stuff? <laughs> and they said, oh, like, can I? I said, well, yes, because in every sacred city there's a garbage dump. <laughs> and in every gar garbage dump city there's a nice clean place. And inside of you there's a garbage dump and a nice clean place. You can decide which one you live in. Well, it's all right with me. Whichever one you decide is whichever one you decide. The level above that that I work in and work from as an energy field would be called the soul level. That's a term that's been kicked around an awful lot and people say define it. In fact, an engineer once many years ago who was teaching me how to lecture, <laughs> he didn't know that he was doing it purposefully, but he would sit there in the audience as I was talking and he would pose these questions and, and his mind was so clear and so perceptive and so direct it would just get through to me. And I'd be talking and I'd turn around and answer his question. And so I talked about the soul, and he said, what is a soul? And I turned around and said, it's an energy unit, and kept going. Uh, but that was in his terms, and he understood from that time on what a soul is, that it's an energy unit. Now the housewife, she says, what is it? And I say, it's a Maytag washer, and a dryer, and a deep freeze, and the maid who does all that. And you get to relax. And she says, ah, oh, I, I sort of get that a little bit clearer now. It's a statement of freedom. And I say, yeah. It's a free statement. To the theological student, I say it's the divinity. And to those here in the spiritual path, I say it's God in essence. Not God in totality, in essence. But the essence of that is the divineness. The difficulty in knowing and having that is often expressed this way almost universally across the planet. And then it goes like this. Don't you tell me what to do. Any of you ever had that experience? Well, I just wonder if you're out there. <laughs> the other one is, who do you think you are telling me? And when you're not verbalizing it, you're sitting back with this energy of the soul and the divineness and the knowing coming through but not real clear. And you're saying, oh, they're not so hot. They're not so smart. They don't know so much even though they're driving Rolls Royce Cadillacs and own all the buildings and you're paying the rent, you still will judge them as not knowing so much. Well, they know that much to have you pay them. You say, well, that's not everything. In fact, it's not really anything. Because the person may be miserable who's getting all the money. Like, where am I going to spend this $10 million? Now, that's a misery I've never had the pleasure of enjoying. Uh, and, and I'm open for that, Lord. It's okay. <laughs> Except when I get it, I, I think, gee, there's so many things that could be done with this for so many people. And then it's gone again, which is all right, too. Um, the soul level, then, in us as a human being, when we experience that, and I'm going to try to put it in vocabulary, and look, this will be a lie, okay? Because I'm going to try to tell you something in words that doesn't have any words connected to it. So I'd like to let you know, first of all, that that's it. But if I don't tell you, I may be denying you the chance to get past my words and get it anyway. So I'm going to tell you, then you can risk it, and I won't have to be concerned. When the energy of the soul moves in us, that soulic movement, out of nowhere, independent of the thought and how we feel and what the body's been doing, joy comes up. And a happiness over nothing. Often 
conveyed with giggling <laughs> and try to stop it and it gets worse because you can't suppress soul action energy. And when does that usually appear? In church, when you're supposed to be quiet <laughs> or just about when you're ready to kiss your girl for the first time and you start laughing or you're kissing your boyfriend, whichever way that works. And it comes up as complete irresponsibility to what you're doing on this level. It very frankly doesn't seem to care. Scripture said God is not a uh, respecter of persons. And I said, well, you know, that may very well be, and I'm not going to argue with the Scripture, but I'd like to present another point of view. He doesn't seem to be a respecter of the time of the person either. Because when it, you want the joy to come up to show somebody you have joy in the soul, it doesn't do anything. It's, come on, up! Uh, and it just sits there with the form of free-floating anxiety moving in and around the stomach and like little tensions here and there. And you think, well, I don't know what this is, but I don't know if I like it. If that's the soul, the soul doesn't reside in the stomach, folks. That's the lower self. The soul actually resides as its home base, right? between the third eye here and down to the top of the head, right back of the eyes and up, often called and referred to as the tenth door. What are the other nine doors? Well, if we start with the eyes, two, and the nose, two, and the mouth, one, and the ears, then you can go down and fig figure out the rest. You'll find out as you're counting that there are nine, <laughs> if you're fast. <laughs> the tenth one is a portal. And it sits back actually sort of in the midbrain area. And it's not the pituitary gland or the pineal gland, but it is around that. That's generally where we find the soul on people. Now, remember the old statement? The eyes are the windows to the soul. Too true. Too true. So when you see somebody with bloodshot eyes, that means they have a bloodshot soul, right? <laughs> well, not necessarily. It may just be smoggy. It may be that they've cried. It could be allergies. They'll tell you it's allergies if they don't want you to know they've been crying. We all have our excuse and our reasons for whatever we're doing so that we don't betray who we really are. Now, who we really are is divine. There's just no question about that because we're made by God and out of God's image and into God's image. He's had his hand in it. The nice thing about that is, did God make a mistake? Or did it, was he just underachieving when he made man? <laughs> it, it becomes, you know, a, a sort of a thorny question to find out what's really going on because you look at people and you think, ah, they're terrible looking and they're bad and they're this and they're that. But go look in the mirror. It might humble you a little bit. <laughs> Especially when somebody says, if you're so smart, what were you doing on the second day in the first grade in school? You go, well... I don't remember that. Well, what were you doing? I was home with my mother because I didn't go the first day. <laughs> that's where I know I was the second day. But you didn't know that. Well, but see, that's an exception. No, it just so happened that we all have our judgments and our reasons locked up behind a whole gamut of warriors back here to attack whoever comes against our reason. There's no need to do that. The essence of the divine of the soul is connected to a greater essence called God. And that essence extends down to everybody as one energy. As amazing as it may seem, there's probably one line of electricity into this building with all these lights coming off it. And we say, well, that's a light, and that's a light, and that's a light. And so we can see them as individual in their action, in their reflection, but the energy behind it's one energy. The energy behind us in the soul is one energy. Now, there are a lot of people that want to play the game of different energies. And it doesn't take too long, if you know about energy, to find out they're kidding around. They are manipulating your mind. Now, that one energy, for lack of a better word, is called love and power. Is there a difference? No. The one who has total love has total power.
Now here comes the definition of God. Who then is God? God is the one who has more power than all the other people put together. Or that's not God. Everything else put together with all of its energy and power, God has more. Now, the interesting thing about that is looking through all the reflective planes. The reflective will be, you see me because I reflect light. I see you because you reflect light. If you absorbed all, absorbed all the light, you'd be a black hole walking around. And we wouldn't see you. We might run into you and be absorbed. <laughs> that, that could be fun. I know a lot of people try to absorb other people uh, through a lot of mechanisms, emotionality and sexuality and financiality and uh, all that. But they can't do it. After they get through all the manipulation, we pick up our marbles and go home. Maybe not right then, but eventually we go called death. Most of us say, yay, but I don't know what goes on there. You can know. That's the key thing. If you have to wait to die to find out if there's a spiritual reality, it's too late. How do you know ahead of time? Anything that is connected to anything can be traced. My fingernail can be traced to my finger, and the finger to my hand, and the wrist, and the arm, and the elbow, and right up to an intellectual form. The intellectual form can be traced back through the unconscious and attached to the soul. If we had, with our type of thinking in society, as cultured as we are, and as civilized as we are, whatever that is, and we had divine energy pouring through us, there would be mass murder going on because we'd all be trying to establish a hierarchy through the intellect against somebody else and we would then destroy their body so that we wouldn't have to put up with them. And we'd have the ability to do that except someplace back in them resides exactly the same energy coming in against you at exactly the same force and it neutralizes itself. What happens is when you get antimatter coming against matter, the matter destroys, implodes and the antimatter resides very scientific definition of the soul with a physical body. The spirit is anti-matter and this world is matter. When the spirit moves into the world, it will destroy it. So what it does is it sets its vibrations as it comes down through the etheric, and the mental, and the emotional, and the astral. And we are then the conductors of divine energy all the time. And that energy will allow us to corrupt it. Hate, lust, joy, despair, greed, anger, and allow us to do anything else with it. Be happy, be joyful, raise a family, secure a family, love our spouse, our children, be a, a stalwart member of society, lift everyone around us, and also allow us to see the very essence of God's essence in other people when we so decide to look. We cannot see spirit by looking directly because we are trained through our visual perceptions in this world to see materiality directly. But we see it always obliquely. When I'm looking directly at you, the oblique vision picks up the spirit very clearly. Have you ever been sitting doing something you think you see something move out of the side of your head and you turn your head to look and it's not there but you knew it was there? but you can't prove it because it's gone. But, but it, was, it was there enough that it shook you up. Your heart's going, boom, 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 And you're going, oh, wow, I don't know what that was. But yeah, yeah. Then it goes on the other side, and you go, what on earth is this? So then you're sitting like this, and then it happens in front of you. You go, oh, I'm going crazy. No, maybe you're going clairvoyant, clear vision, but crazy, no. A lot of people are declaring themselves having nervous breakdowns. That's just a misdirection of a label. Why not call it a nervous breakthrough? We are constantly breaking through the barriers of our limitation. And we argue for our limitation and fight against it at the same time. I want to be free. Don't do that. Who are you to talk to me like that? Don't, don't run that on me. Don't do that to me. But I'm free. Well, if you're free, why do you limit me? Why do you restrict me? 
Well, because that part that's free is not the part that speaks. The part that speaks is very little, very minor, and very upset by what you're doing. The other part that I'm attempting to get through loves you no matter what you do, and that's fine. And the other part doesn't care to be around what you're doing. We have that clash then. I can't be with you and I can't be away from you. I can't live with you. I can't live without you. Hey, what a dilemma. Then we dramatize the dilemma by crying, by getting upset, and pull the energy of the soul down and trap it in our emotional reactions. So therefore, we don't get a clear expression of our soul through our body. We don't get to bring the kingdom of heaven down through and out into the world because we're in a reactive state against what's going on. I don't like what you did. I don't like you say that. Don't do that. I'd kill him. Get out of here. Leave me alone. Who said that? I don't care. Just reactions. At some moment we stop and take action, the first action we have to do is come into an observable position where we can just sit and say, let me see what you're doing. They do it. Say, tell me why you're doing that. They tell you, go, hmm. What it looked like to me was you hated me and you're out to get me and that's why you did that. And now you tell me that it was just your foot had gone to sleep and that's why you did that. <laughs> didn't look like that to me. I mean, when you went, <coughs> I thought you were getting ready to kick me and you were just getting your foot awake. Oh, golly. How am I going to get past these obvious misrepresentations? How am I going to get past them if I keep getting trapped by what the body does and what I think it's doing? And what the implication of what it is doing if I were doing that. The only way we can possibly come to any way oh, in a state of sane reality is to get into the soul level and perceive life directly without seeing life as a reflection. Get above all the waves of the physical body and the astral and the emotional and the mental. Get above that because that's just a distortion in front of the face constantly. It constantly is being played. We constantly project our own visual processes against the sky of our own mind and see that as the spiritual form and follow and mislead ourselves all the time. But when we break back into the soul level and we see that, it is clear without necessarily having form as we perceive it through this world. It has its own beingness and its own reality and a very separate reality at that, living at the same time in the reality with us. That's a paradox and another conflict. In the world, it seems like we are in conflict all the time. Theologians call it me against the devil, or the devil against me. Uh, other people call it negative thinking. Others call it positive thinking. Some say you must have a good mental attitude, and some say you have a lousy attitude. So there are a lot of ways to discover and discuss this conflictive thing that goes on inside of us. It's, I, I want to go, but I don't know. Have you ever been hungry and want to go get something deep, but you don't know where you want to go? That type of dilemma pervades almost everything we do. And on top of the pervading action of what's going on, there sits a, a decision-making device called me. Me, a composite of the astral, causal, mental, etheric, Soul, me, making decision, using information from everywhere I can get it so that the decision I make will be uplifting to me and may be assisting to you if you're involved in it. If you're not, then it doesn't concern you. Not directly. It may concern you only in vibratory ways. Like if you're standing by water and I throw a great big rock and it splashes on you, you get it as a vibratory wave. But it didn't really directly involve you. It directly involved the rock in the water. So we often pick up these things then on the glance, on the side. Now, is there a way to go back in so that I know that I'm doing that because my mind will trick me, my mind will deceive me. Have you all seen these Muller illusions and the ink block tests and you look at and, and the, one time it's a vase and you look again, it's two faces and you look again, it's a vase and you wonder where the faces went. And then there are all these type of illusionary fields just shifting the focus from the right to the left eye will change that as we shift our focus back and forth. 
You can stand out at night looking up at the sky and look at a star and it looks like it's moving. As your vision shifts from the right to the left eye as you look up there, it gives the, that it's moving out there. It's moving back here, inside of you. Then if you know there's cosmic winds up there blowing dust across the face of it, you know that's going to give you illusion of what you're looking at. So it's awful hard to trust that, extremely hard. And we study long years in a discipline to know if we really know something. A surgeon, a neurosurgeon, studies years to find out, is that nerve really the nerve? Can I really connect them? Can I really do this? And studies and studies and critiques themselves. It's called critical analysis. And when they get through, they have mastered something here in this world that's very nice and useful here in this world. And it doesn't have too much to do with who they are as a spiritual person. Only as it reflects in their kindness, their empathy, their one with the person, their understanding, their uplifting of the person at the time they're doing surgery and after, that they're supportive and caring and sharing the support with the person is the spiritual action that goes with the surgery. If they're treating you like a piece of meat, they're a butcher. It's the only difference. Inside of us sits two factors that are part of the divine currents of energy. One is light, L-I-G-H-T, we call that living in God's holy thoughts. And the other is sound, S-O-U-N-D, the sound of God. Now we're going to take just a very short trip back historically. In the very beginning, a word was spoken. And that word spoken was creation. It wasn't, God didn't stand up and say, creation, but it was a vibratory frequency that was creation. And as it stepped down through all the levels, that sound changed as it hit each frequency. And as it came down, it changed its light frequency. And as it created down into the man form inside of us, we have anchored in the physical world exactly the same thing that's anchored in God, the light and the sound, the light of God. All the great teachers that come in the world, in terms of spiritual teachers, have said, the light, the father of lights, I am the light. This is to refer to not the mundane light, but the brightness of divinity, that light, the very brightness of it. That is our soul in its manifestation. In its dormant state, we don't see it as so much. It, it, it's just quiet. We often wonder, is there anybody in there? We think the person's spaced out. And often they have. The soul's gone and they're spaced out. They have a difficult time here. We can then, through certain spiritual exercises, meditative techniques, or contemplative action, go back inside by placing the attention in the forehead, back here, and keep placing the attention, not rolling the eyes up like that, back in the head, that'll give you a headache. But that's often what happens when you place attention back there is that the eyes will start rolling up. And then people say, I get this severe headache when I'm meditating. I say, well, relax your eyes. And sometimes we tell them, just put your hands over your eyes like this. And so if you go to roll the eyeball up, you'll catch it with your fingers. You'll feel it, and then you can pull it back down. Because when you're in there, and you're busy seeing the brightness of the inner worlds, you're not aware of the eyelids rolled up. You're not aware that your leg came up like this, and you're doing this. <laughs> the body will start doing spontaneous movements to purify blocked-up energy fields, to free yourself, called kriyas. That energy comes loose and starts flowing through the body, and we sense it as a subtle light energy. All we have to do is keep focused on that. If we keep focused on that, we will go so high, and then we stop. And that is just as high as the top of the etheric world or the bottom of the soul world. Right in there is known as the cosmic mirror. People have come up to this in the inner travels, a lot of the yogis and sages and sadhus and a lot of the avatars, and they see this great cosmic mirror and they see themselves in the great divinity and declare themselves God, except they haven't gotten a soul yet. But it is so magnificent that they'd be a fool not to declare themselves God, because that's what they are when they were down here physically too. The very thing is we are all that, 
but we are not the great omniscient God out there as the great creator. But we're still God because we have the essence in us. We just want to declare ourselves a, a, um, by our preferential level sexually or by our occupation. I'm a dentist. What are you when you're not in the office? Dentist. You married? Yeah. Are you husband? Oh, yeah, I'm a husband. Well, what are you? No, I'm a dentist. Husband second. What are you before all of that? A man. What are you before all of that? What's the prior condition before all of your conditions? Well, I'm just me. Okay, that's who I want to talk to then. I don't want to talk to your label. Because I don't know what label you're going to be having today. I mean, you may have changed jobs and I don't know it. I mean, you, may, you may have been a ditch digger and now you're a clerk. And, and you know, I'm treating you like a ditch digger instead of a jerk. And, and how do I know the difference? So <laughs> if you let me know, I can know how to do that. Not that all clerks are jerks, but often you get the impression that, that they're doing something strange. <laughs> the very action that we must have then is going in, connecting to the light, and listening to the sound current, the audible sound that comes through us. And it'll come to us as recognizable, distinct sounds, not as a cosmic energy like zzz, like high frequency wires, and nor as like static in the ears, nor as a pounding, like a seashore wave pounding. Those are cosmic sounds that are reflecting in the inner worlds inside of you. And often as the blood rushes by your ears up through the veins here, it'll make sound when you're quiet listening. And you can hear your own blood rushing by and hear it ringing in your ears and you think you're hearing the sound current. And I tell people, better go see a doctor. You may have a problem. And it may not be spiritual. Better go check to see if you've got high blood pressure or something else working. If there's no physical basis for what you're hearing, you're hearing cosmic sounds. Now, in there, you have to be trained to pick out the sound that is distinctly and specifically the divine current that the cosmic sounds are radiating out from. And there are techniques to do that. It'll make a sound as a bell, as a violin, as a bubbling brook. The bell is the one we'll listen for, because that's the sound of the soul as it makes its sound. The interesting thing is you go to some churches and they'll ring bells and they have bells in their services, because a long time ago, back in their tradition, before it became a tradition, they were sitting on the very essence of truth and reality of what it was, and they were doing that. But then they got in the tradition and got stereotyped and then dramatized into a teaching, and then everybody follows the teaching, but they don't follow the sound current. They just follow the teaching. What's in the books, what they follow, and if it isn't in the book, that's too bad. That's like me following a map to get in downtown Denver. If the street isn't on the map, then I won't go there, but the street still exists. But I'll declare it not to be so because it's not on the map. Well, you say, well, that's foolish. Go find out. Yeah, but if it's not there, why would I go find out? Ask somebody that's been there. The traveler, the consciousness that I represent physically, but I am not physically, has been there on these levels and takes those people that are tied into it back in through the levels and breaks through the soul. Because a lot of people do soul travel in their own body, their own inner universe. Oh, inside there are worlds without end, universe upon universes. You can travel in there for 400,000 million lifetimes and never get out of your body. And it's always a new experience, as boring as it gets to be at times. It's like, oh, I've been over this route before, but maybe something will happen different today. The same thing as yesterday. When you're in the soul, above the soul level of the physical body, there is no boredom. There's no time, there's no effort, there's no element of anything. There is just the bliss of the divinity. And at the same time, you can get stuck there unless you have somebody that can pull you and lead you and direct you above the levels. Have you ever gone in to eat in the cafeteria and you load your plate up with the appetizers and the salads and, and then you get down with the entree and you can't have it because you're too full? You say, well, why didn't somebody tell me they had that entree? That's, what I, that's my favorite, but I'm so full now. I didn't even leave room for dessert. Why didn't you tell me they had that dessert? Well, if you'd gone down and looked down the line and then come back, you'd have known too. Well, then I'd have been out of line and wouldn't have my place and somebody else been in front of me and I have all these reasons why I don't do it. But then you don't get what you want either. You get what you get. And you might as well just choose what you get and then you get what you choose. 
Because that's the way it's working for you. And that doesn't mean you have to like it, but you might as well, because there it is. And it was your choice, and if you don't like that, make different choices. Make different approaches. Look at it from a radical point of view if you have to. Not a ridiculous point of view. But sometimes the ridiculous point of view can point up the truth that is present and the fallacy that is present. And both of those can be very freeing to you. Now, many people will close their eyes and go in to meditate, and their mind goes zing, 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 car wash, get to go do this, do this phone call, I got to go to the job, or open their eyes and away they go. Or somebody calls them up on the phone and says, uh, Your wife's down here, I'm your attorney, her attorney, and she's leaving. And you go, What? I didn't know that. Now, what we're doing is in the reactive state. And there is a key that we exercise first thing. Every time anything happens to us, there's a fundamental approach that's number one, and it is the state of observation. All these conditions that rise and that fall in our life, the very dilemmas, she doesn't love me, she leaves me, I didn't get the job, I didn't get the raise and pay, they, you wouldn't initiate me, I didn't get ordained, my discourses got lost in the mail. All these conditions that rise and fall, oh, you wrote me a letter and I think it's nasty, and it was a loving letter. It wasn't nasty at all. But the conditions of their reality rise and fall. They rise and fall with them. Oh, you're going to take me to the show? How wonderful. Not tonight. Oh, wow. Tonight? Oh, wow. What show? Oh, I don't want to go to that show. <laughs> and we're just rising and falling. And we're like a yo-yo. It's very easy to talk about this when those conditions aren't rising and falling. <laughs> Very, very, but let one of them rise and fall like the guy sideswipes your car. And you get out and you look at your car. And you tell this guy, What did you do? And he says, I hit your car. So I know that. Why'd you hit it? Couldn't avoid it. If I could avoid it, I would have. You weren't trying hard enough. Yes, I was. The brakes went out. Steering wheel shifted, and I had a minor heart attack, especially when I saw I was going to hit your car. <laughs> if you think you were hurt, you should have seen what I was going through, knowing I was going to hit it and was trying not to. And when I hit the brake, my foot missed off and hit the gas, and it jumped and hit you. Car, it ain't my fault, it's the cars. Whoever invented them, get that guy. And who's ever selling the gas in the world, get them. Not me, I'm innocent. I'm a good driver, I got a license. And why'd you park your car there anyway? It's your fault. If you hadn't parked your car there, I couldn't hit it. And the other guy's saying, gee, I'm really sorry. I didn't mean to park my car here. I'll, I'll pay for your damage. Somehow I feel like a victim, though. Somehow I feel like you hit my car. Why should I pay you? You pay. Or I'll kill you. You're going to kill me over $4.50? What do you mean? It costs more than that. It's all I got. That's all you're going to get. It may cost you $400, but you only got $450 out of me. You know, it's life savings. And the guy walks around, oh, this world, I hate it. All these people, they're all lousy drivers. They're all these people in this town, they ought to just blow it up. There's just one person that hit you. Why do you want to kill everybody? Why, why are you after that? Because the conditions are rising and falling. How am I going to get time off my work to get my car fixed? I don't know. That's not my problem. It's your car. I just hit it. <laughs> well, what am I going to do about it? I don't know. Go see your insurance agent. See what he's got to say. Well, why come you're not more upset? Because it isn't going to make your car better if I get upset. It's bad enough that I hit it. It's bad enough that my own car is upset. It's bad enough, bad enough, bad enough. I'm not going to react. Would you like to go have a beer and we can sit and talk about it? Yeah, I could use a beer. <laughs> Let's go have four or five, maybe a six-pack. <laughs> then the conditions fall. Stone drunk, can't get up. Well, what a nice person. <laughs> then later on, you sober up, you have a headache, and the car's still ruined. <laughs> well, what a nice guy. I like to kill him, but guys, my friend now. <laughs> we're going to go bowling. What am I supposed to do in this world? This is a crazy world. No, that's just the way this world's set up. Well, what about the guy that hit my car? 
He seemed real cool about it. What did you want him to do? Get a sledgehammer and finish off your car? <laughs> well, what were you after? Well, I don't know what I was after. I just didn't want him to do it. Why don't you tell him? I didn't want you to hit my car. And he says, I didn't want to hit it. Then you both can sit there and cry. And if that gets the car fixed, I got an awful lot of cars I want to cry over. <laughs> and if it doesn't do anything, what is it you've got to do? I guess what I have to do is stop reacting and stop being part of the emotional rise and fall of what's going on and, and uh, oh, I'll get my wife to take it down. I'll just use her car to go to work because she's off next, next week. And uh, oh, I think what I'll do is I'll go rent one of these new cars because I'm thinking of buying one. I was going to trade this one in anyway. I won't get as much now. And I'll go rent a new car and see if that's one I really wanted to get because I haven't had time to go down and test drive one anyway. I'll drive one for a week. Hey, you know, it's kind of neat that you hit my car because now I'm going to get what I want. Well, wait a minute. What about all this negativity you flacked out at me about hitting your car? Yeah, well, I was a little emotional. What do you mean, a little? Well, you have to forgive me my emotions. Nonsense, you ran them on me. Well, I didn't hit you. Well, I'm glad you didn't. I, I am thankful that you didn't hit me. Well, then is it okay that I run my emotions? Well, given that if you're going to hit me or run emotions, go ahead and run your emotions. Why? why? Why is it okay to run the emotions? Because I'm going to ignore you. But if you hit me, I've got to pay attention. And I'm not going to pay attention. If I was paying attention, I would have hit your car. Obviously. Wait a minute. You mean you've been driving around not paying attention? Doesn't everybody? <laughs> have any of you ever been driving down the freeway thinking about something and you knew where you are going to turn off and you missed your turn? Raise your hand if you have. Me too. You know, I had mine up. Okay. I just like to let you know that we do drive around not paying attention. That doesn't make us bad because we didn't hit a car. But hit one not paying attention and you feel bad. But that still doesn't make you bad because you feel bad. It just is a bad feeling. You don't like it because you're not happy with the results. That's understandable. But you can't do anything with the results except make amends, pay the price as fast as you can, get it settled, get it over with, and come into your life and start living it right now in the newness of it. It's difficult, but that's how you live life in a happy state without being subjected to the rise and fall of the emotions. Every time somebody talks about a tax cut or something, somebody screams and somebody else's pocketbook gets a little fatter. Because those who are losing their money are screaming louder than those who are fattening up the pocketbook. It makes you wonder. But you see, the whole thing of it is, is any money that's spent has gone anyway. There's no way you can recoup it. It's gone. All you can do is get more money to do what you're after. So you come into the observation of what is to be done, what is to do, and move on that. Complete the action in your world. Sit down to meditate. You think, yeah, I hit the guy's car, but he's got it fixed. So that's over with. And I was late yesterday, but I wrote them a letter. That's over with. Yeah, it's okay. I'll go inside and look. Ooh, that's nice. The mind doesn't go out because it's not rising and falling with the energies of the body. Because we've contained them, we've directed them, and we held them. Not as a form of manipulation and control out there but as a form of self-direction from here. See, probably, honestly and truly, the only person you or I, I'll use it as my own self, the only person I can truly control is myself. And I can't control you. And I'm not going to. I'm going to allow you to do what you do. And if I don't like it, I will take it in my head and turn it. I'll control how, what I look at. If I don't like something else, I will take my body and move it. I will be able to control this if I can't get you to stop what you're doing. But why should I get you to stop what you're doing when you're already perfectly in line with what you're doing and you're doing it because it's perfect for you? When I sit in judgment and try to control, I am rising and falling with the conditions of life as I see them. Not as they are, as I see them. And I will try to declare the way I see them to be the way they are. And that's a fundamental error. The way they are is the way they are. The one thing that dramatizes that drastically is this approach. The way it is is the way it is. Can't stop it. 
What you didn't know, though, is it had a little light in it. Everything does. And the idea is to get more light so that you fill up the vacancies in the space inside of you that you've left to old hurts and old pains and old guilts and old griefs. And fill this body up with the light of your own beingness and the light of God's beingness in you. And whatever avatar or sage or guru or rishi or whoever you worship, put them in with you. They don't want to go, you don't need them. And if you go in there and they're not there already, they weren't there anyway. So you don't have to play around with it. So you can just go in with confidence. Wherever you have that anxiety, that hurt, that resentment, that bad feeling, when you go in and you see it in there and it distracts you and you start thinking over what happened before and you start doing it all over again, somebody else has got hold of your life and is running it and you're not in control of your body. You are not taking your space and this is the only space available to you, inside of you. You're not taking it with you as the spirit and filling it up so that even your hands are happy. You don't have to have happy feet. You can have happy hands. You can have a happy heart, happy neck. Smile with your forehead. Here, wake up. Okay, there it is. But you can have the joy. And while you are in the soul energy, you don't deal with restrictions, inhibitions, prohibitions, nothing like that. Because you're dealing right here in this moment. This moment here has always been the moment. That gets a little philosophical, but that happens to be true. Any other moment is reflective. What we talked about ten minutes ago, we have to reflect back to it. Oh yeah, see I go back, he said, uh, all right. Well, now what are you right now while you were back there? I missed it. Repeat it. No, listen. Come on, repeat it. If I repeat it for you, I'm back there with you. I already am. So I might as well tell you, because you got me back to talking about it, and then we'll get present. So you pay the price, tell them, and get present. What is the price? Going out of the present right now to deal with it and then come back again. What happens is we go out and we start dealing, and we deal, and we deal, and we deal, and we deal, and we say, God, I'm so tired. We'll sit up straight. Oh, well, I didn't mean to get all bent out of shape. But that happens. We do get bent out of shape. And then we carry on these conversations. I say, and then she says, and I say, and then she says, and then I'm going to get mad and smack her, and then she's going to shoot you. Who said that? That isn't part of the conversation. No, she's having another conversation about shooting you, and you got caught in it. Hey, I don't want that. I'll go over and say, I love you. She loves me. I'll kiss her. She'll kiss me. And we'll go to bed together. When we get married, we'll raise a bunch of kids. And then there'll be braces for the kids. And, uh, <laughs> Shoes and socks and education. It's $25,000 for a kid to educate. I don't want to get married. Well, where'd you go? Well, I went out in the future. But that may not be what it's like. What do you mean? Maybe 40 kids. <laughs> but you may also strike oil. Ah. I didn't know that. I know, but because you don't know... Why get caught in the dilemma of the not knowing and run the condition that is not present and you don't know it? You can assume that it's all going to be as wonderful as you can assume it's all going to be terrible. If you're running the assumptions, run them to your advantage. What's to your advantage? It's going to be a great day. What if it isn't? Tomorrow. It's going to be a great day. What if it is? That's wonderful. Do tomorrow. Yeah, but it only happens once in my lifetime. Come on, how do you know that? This has been it. <laughs> Are you going to die? No. Then tomorrow, come on, maybe you'll get two. Tomorrow you get up and say, it's going to be a great day like yesterday. No, no. No, no, don't do that one. That one's done. But it was so good. Come on, you're caught in a condition. Okay, today will be... What today is? Does that sound good? Yeah, but I want like yesterday. <laughs> You're caught in the condition. Yeah, I know I'm caught. So what? I have a right to be caught, don't I? Now you're reacting. Yeah? Well, take this. That's real spiritual of you. Huh? Oh, I, I, didn't, I, I was just kidding. <laughs> Do you think she'll be home today like she was yesterday? Why don't you go down and find out and get present? 
Why don't you get, go find out and get present? Take your present, go down, ring the doorbell. She's not in. She's not home. I know, she's out with somebody else. She doesn't really love me. Yesterday she lied. I know it's terrible. What, what are you doing? I'm running the condition. Why? What do you mean, why? Well, the neighbor told me that she was run over by a car and she's in the hospital and they don't think she'll live. Oh, my God. And I was, oh, what am I, why did I do this other thing for? So, why are you doing anything? Why don't you just find out? That's what the mind is about, folks. Use it to find out. If you make a decision based upon the emotions, you've got it for a long time and you've got to eat it. If the decision's been real good, thank you. And if it's not, you're going to have to eat it anyway because it will react upon you until you absorb the energy because you're the creator. You put it out. It's been your field of energy and it's going to come back to you and whatever it brings back, you get. Stands to reason then, if I'm going to get back what I put out, I see today I feel sexy. I think I put out sexy vibes. And nothing came back today. It was all day long. Nobody showed up. I know, you didn't get out of your bedroom. <laughs> but you said I could put out, oh, you got to do more than that. You got to put your body on the line. I mean, if it was other than that, why bother? It's a fantasy. Well, you had your fantasy. Now what's the next thing? Hmm. Boy, this world's really complicated, isn't it? No. Is there a key? Sure. The whole thing wraps down to one fundamental issue. Love it all. Love it all. If you love it all today, when you look back tomorrow, what do you see? Loving. There's nothing to distract you, so you come present. With a whole series of lovings back there, you look back down the line, gee, for the last six months, it's been fantastic loving, and you come present, and you say, it's going to be good down here six months because I got a record. That's called confidence, a good feeling, feelings of self-esteem, and the psychologists say, you're really well. The spiritual people say, you've been doing it the right way. Not my way, not necessarily your way, but the right way for you that worked and the process brings health, wealth, and happiness. Not necessarily money and wealth, but you may have a wealth of friends and a wealth of nice thoughts and a wealth of joy and happiness. And people come to you and they share with you financially, emotionally, mentally, they bring their new baby to you to see because they want to share the divine that's come out of their body in a baby form and want you to love it. What a great tribute to you. I love you so much as a person. I want you to hold my baby and kiss it and love it because that's my baby. And you go, wow. That's friendship as it bonds together. That's why I say there's only one. One plus how many other numbers still comes back to one. If you're loving, that one is an integral. The integral is integrity. The integrity is unification and union inside of you so that the mind, the emotions, and the body, and the spirit are single in its focus and its direction. And that direction, by the essence of our pulling nature towards God, is God, is the divine, and it can be the divine in another person. It doesn't have to be going, sitting in a cloister or a monastery or a church and worshiping some object up there in front of you or praying to a candle. And I'm not saying this is good or bad. But why settle for something that can't move when you can have a human being? If you're going to worship somebody, the human is the most logical choice because they can give back to you. But if you're praying to a statue, you better pray really effectively. It isn't doing too much. What happens is you pray the statue and you don't get any static. So then you feel good and you get up and go do it and then you say your prayers are answered. Sure, you answered them. The self-fulfilling prophecy. That's not bad. That's fantastic. But in the meantime, it gets to be a little lonely because the human quality that we are, man, is made as God in the Spirit. That's why we really do hurt when we see somebody else hurting. That's why we really do care. But we only care 
when that loving, caring space is opened. And when it's open, we're so vulnerable in our feelings that we feel like we're walking on eggshells. That's not bad for somebody who usually goes around stomping everything. That's okay to walk on eggshells for a while. People may encourage you to keep in that changed position. People find their heart come open and they say, I never knew I had all of that. We say it's because you've changed. And then they go back to the environment, that same little garbage hole and get in there and they close their heart back down again because who wants their heart open for garbage? Nobody. So you have to make the change in here, reflect out there, and make the fundamental effort to just move through your life in a loving, open space. It's not difficult, but it does take willpower instead of won't power. It takes the can power instead of the can't power. I will, I can. And then it reflects back to us, I did it. I did it. And then you come to, I am doing it now. You do by doing. There's no other way. The doing may be mental, emotional, and physical, and it will respond to the world back to you how you put it out. You want it physically? Do it physically. You want it mentally? Just do it mentally. You want it emotionally? Just do it emotionally. If you want it all, do it spiritually. May Ruth Beishan.